As we know, we, Mike has been uh, out uh, the last few weeks because of his accident that he had. But Mike's back. Mike Dorward's back today, and he's asked to share just a brief testimonial with us today. Uh, Charles Stanley said one time that uh, God never releases a test uh, without a purpose, and. Uh, I was, I was thinking of, of, of several things God did, and uh, another statement by Charles, uh, Charles Chuck uh, Swindoll said, the last place a person can see themselves is inside a casket. And, but we know, we all know that there's, a, in Hebrews 9.27, there's a point on the men wants to die, and after this, the judgment. And I think about that day, I started out that day, and, and one, just for a simple bike ride, I was planning on doing 44 miles in the got to the 16 mile marker and it was closed and I began my journey back and that's when the accident happened and uh, there's a lot of things that, that occurred there first of all I broke five ribs or fractured five ribs of collarbone and punctured along and and uh, in the in that moment there was nobody around it was a Monday there's only past two people on the trail and I was uh, I was left by myself I'm, I, I couldn't hardly stand up I couldn't sit down there was no position I could really get myself in any comfort at all and I remember uh, grabbing my phone and calling 911 and, and uh, they connected me to the, uh, the people that I, another person and it went dee 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 you know you ever had one of those days <laughs> nothing was going right anyway uh, the uh, I called it back to 911 got through and then it was like 25 minutes that went by and then three riders came by and asked me if I was all right <coughs> And I said, no, I said, you need to call 911, see if they're real, they know where I'm at. And they all three tried to call and no one had a signal. And then I said, use my phone because uh, I got through and they tried my phone and there was no signal. And about five minutes later, they came and they took me in, in, in the ambulance and then they airlifted me to, to uh, Cumberland. But uh, while I was there, on, I want to take you back to the bike ride. I'm, I'm 16 miles from where I started. My car is down there. And, and what I want to say is, uh, I came. The thought came upon me that this might be it. And I, I can remember at first, I'm thinking, you know, of of my life and my failures, and and then I had to come back to the gospel and rem remind myself that my my salvation is in Christ alone. And there's, there's, he's not looking at my works. Although I, I, he will one day judge my works, but he's not looking at that as my acceptance of salvation. And I, I, it just gave me a peace. And I actually, not only a peace, but I was anxious. I was excited about possibly meeting the Lord. And it was, it was a, a beautiful moment. But several things I'd like to talk about. I'm not going to take the time. But one, one thing that I, I remember, I'm back home. I, many of you know I went to the hospital. And five days later, I was home. And then my lung collapsed. I was back in. And... So all that happened, and I'm, I'm back home, and she's my wife, you know, I can't say enough good about her. Uh, you know, Proverbs says, you know, he that has a good wife has a good thing, you know, and uh, I have a good wife. And she was taking, she's taking care of everything, and I'm out on the deck, and I'm listening to her mow the grass in the upper yard. I can't see her, but I can hear the mower going, and. And I know there's some of you, Chris and Tom, and, you know, you're saying you know, if you need any help, you know, and I appreciate all that. I appreciate all the calls that I got and all that. But I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm kind of sulking, and I'm saying, Lord, you said in, in, in uh, 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 he, I guess it's, if he, I'm trying to think, is it Hebrews, where it says, it, oh, it's, I think it's Ephesians 6, it says, that you sow, you reap. There's a good connotation to that if you read that, that whole scripture. And I, all I know is I'm, I'm saying, Lord, I'd love to see the reality of this verse. Because I'm thinking of my wife out there mowing grass. And I'm telling you, the words weren't even out of my mouth. And here's this riding mower going <laughs> by my neighbor. And God's just shown his faithfulness in all this. And I just want to praise his name. And sometime... You know, if I get a chance to sit down with you and eat or with, and with any one of you, I'd be glad to tell you a ton of other things that he showed me in that. And I just wanted to take time to praise the Lord for what he's done and what, for a good wife and for a good church body. Thank you. Lord. 
God is a faithful God. Amen. Amen. With your Bibles in hand this morning, please turn with me now. This uh, final message in the series, The Church Is, we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> you know, the portrait that we see as we're going to complete here today uh, of the church in, in, in the Bible is, is not only a, a universal picture. In other words, it's, we see the global church, the believers around the world, the redeemed of the Lord, both in heaven before the throne of God and still physically on earth, but uh, spread throughout the, the, the world itself, the earth. But we also see predominantly in the New Testament a, the church locally assembled, the local assembly of believers. And indeed, the, the New Testament letters were mainly written by the apostles to believers who were gathered in local places, in cities and towns and places like that. And Paul would say, well, make sure that this other church in a nearby town or place would read this letter as well and have that opportunity. We have to understand that back in those days, correspondent was scarce. Uh, many people, most people could not read. They were illiterate. And uh, so one have, would have to be read to a letter, a correspondence, and such was the case in many of these instances as, as we find it. But one of the things that we see as well that is that although many of the local churches were spread across what we think of the landscape of the Roman Empire, which was vast, um, they were all marked by certain things, certain qualities, certain characteristics that I still believe mark the church in, in today and here and ought to mark our lives. And it is for that reason that we've been looking at this, this portrait of the church. And so the first, the first piece of the portrait, if you remember back several weeks, was that the church is a redeemed community. We're called by the grace of God and his sovereign mercy in Christ unto salvation. We're anointed by the Holy Spirit for our life and ministry in Christ. We're a redeemed community. The second piece of the portrait we put together then on top of that next to it was a gathered community. The church is a gathered community. We're marked by our devotion to the word of God and to the fellowship of the believers and to doing life together and to the prayers. That was in Acts chapter 2, 42 and following. The third piece of our portrait, as we saw it, was that we are also called to be a sharing community. We're, we're to be known as a people who are selfless in our generosity as because we understand that all that we have, every single thing that we have, not only our physical well-being, but certainly our material things are, are given to us by God, and we are his stewards, we're, we're literally a pipeline. If you think of your life and yourself as a pipeline, and that's how we should think of ourselves as, as we give generously to the needs of the people. We, we give uh, much uh, by demonstration through tithes and offerings here on Sunday mornings, of course, but there are many other ways in which we also are called to give, and we should be giving. Uh, the next piece of the puzzle, or the portrait, was that we are a bold witnessing community. We stand up, in other words, against the tide of a society in a world that has, by and large, rejected uh, the, the, the name of Jesus, uh, have an animus in their heart toward the people of God. But nonetheless, we stand in that place uh, on the wall, if you will, uh, boldly proclaiming the, the name of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, font, the next portrait piece that we saw just a couple of weeks ago was that we are called to be a grace giving community. And we were in the book of Romans there that week, as you remember, and uh, that message really focused on how important it is for us to deploy the, the spiritual gifts and abilities that God has given to us. If you're in Jesus, if you've been born again, God has given to you a spiritual gift or more than one spiritual gift. He's given us talents and gifts and abilities that are given to us, as the Bible says, for the common good, for the good of one another, and ultimately for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it and as a grace-giving community, we, we, we should also seek to be a culture of grace because we realize that we're living in a godless society. And, and how will the people in our community around us here see and, and understand the truth of the message that we verbally proclaim? Well, they'll see it in our lives. Well, they'll understand it by virtue of seeing us displaying the goodness and glory of God. 
and that verifies and validates our testimony. The sixth piece of the puzzle, which we kind of have skipped across, but, but is important nonetheless, is the, the fact that the church is a Christ-like community. And again, that text would have been from Colossians chapter 3, uh, where it speaks about the character of Christ shining through the people of Christ. But today we're going to land on this final piece, which is that we have been called to be a shepherded community, a shepherded community. And we know that the Lord Jesus is, is called and referred to as the great shepherd of the sheep. We know that his authority as the head of the body, the church, is as part of God's design has been given. He's been he's given to the church pastors and teachers. We find that in the book of Ephesians and elders whom God has called to shepherd the local body, the local church under the authority of Christ and His Word. And that brings us now here to Paul's uh, this first of the three pastoral epistles as we know them, First and Second Timothy in the book of Titus. They're known particularly as pastoral epistles. And within these particular letters, you may know, are, are, are specific things that are somewhat unique and, and given to both Timothy and then Titus, his two of his protégés in the faith. Timothy particularly is called his son in the faith repeatedly by Paul. But in these particular epistles, we find information that's going to help to shape and guide our understanding about the shepherded responsibility, the responsibility of a shepherd as we leave the church. And so let's read here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, in these verses, the first, the first thing that we notice is the character of the shepherd. The character of the shepherd. If you look at that list... And the one that we're just now going to turn, turn over with me to Titus, a couple of verse, uh, books back here now, the book of Titus chapter 1, you'll notice here that there, we we're not looking at a job description. You're looking at a character description. That's of the utmost importance. Titus chapter 1, Paul reiterates many of the same kind of qualities, if you will, characteristics. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is why I left you in Crete, he says to Titus, so that you might put, in, put what remained in order and, that, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So the appointment of elders, if you take those two pastoral epistles and the, the, the instruction that Paul is giving now to these men, Titus and Timothy, the appointment of elders in every church tells us that, in fact, this is uh, God's apostolic design for the church, uh, for the local church, particularly as a church body. And those who would suppose that perhaps they are part of a, a group of believers who aren't in it, under any authority and have no such structure, as it were, uh, are actually not walking in line with or in harmony with what Paul says and what the, the Scriptures teach us about the nature and structure of the church as God has given it to his people. 
for the purposes that we'll see here, to guide and direct and oversee the body of Christ. So these two scriptures here that we just now read stand alone as a pla- as a place where we find the officer of the office of elder, or as it's referred to in the ESV here, the overseer, which is the Greek word episkopos. Okay, so we see this the elder, the office of the elder, pastor elder, uh, clearly defined. And again, it's defined not by his job but by his character. And that's really important. And as I can assure you that as our uh, pastoral search team met, one of the things that came out in our conversation as we were beginning to assemble a, a description of a position for an associate pastor of, of discipleship and family ministries here for Living Word, the, one of the prominent things that we continued to go back to was most importantly the character of the man, not the, not the particular job description that, that we see carried out by that person. And so the first thing that's listed here is, and there actually are 15 things, and we're just going to roll through these rather quickly this morning. There's 15 character descriptions that you find here. The first is that he must not be, he must be rather above reproach. And I think that because it's the first thing, not only here, but also again in Titus 1, verses 6 and 7, he must be above reproach. It's almost like the, the capstone of the, of the list of all. So what does it mean to be above reproach? Well, it's about his moral integrity that can't be questioned or uh, sus- it's not suspect or found to be suspect, discovered, in other words, like a skeleton in the closet that once discovered would bring dis- disrepute to the name of Christ. Or, or somehow harm befall the local church that he pastors. And again, tragically, uh, we've heard, we've all heard stories. If you're as old as I am, many, many, many times of pastors who have fallen because of one thing or another, who whose skeleton in their closet came out, and perhaps it was underground, but. What happens was, is that the name of Christ is brought into disrepute. That's the most prominent concern. And secondarily, and directly connected to it, is the fact that the church itself then becomes suspect and can be easily incriminated by people who are the skeptics or unbelievers. So the first thing we see here is that he must be above reproach. The second thing, it speaks here about he must be the husband of one wife. And the, the literal reading there, as you may know, is that he, he's a one-woman man. He's a one-woman man. He, I put it this way. He's a faithful, loving husband. He's a, he's a one-woman man. Paul, Titus uses the same, we find that same thing referenced there in, in, in Titus. He's a, he's a one-woman man. You know? So in other words, committed to his wife, earnestly, faithful, devoted, godly, all of those kinds of things as we'll see here later in this very list in terms of his responsibility as a father and husband in the home. So he's he's a faithful, loving husband. Thirdly, he's sober-minded. Sober-minded. This has nothing whatsoever to do with his consumption of alcohol, although the idea of soberness often is connoted that way. Sober-mindedness, really, there's a, a great synonym when the word is he's circumspect. Circumspect. What does that mean? That means you consider everything the, all the way around, every, from every point of view before you make a decision. You're thoughtful, you're, con, you're prudent, you're not rash, you're circumspect, you, you take your time, you're thinking about what, what, what needs to be done before you act. So you're not acting imprudently or intemperately or, uh, and so forth, rashly, he's circumspect, sober-minded. The next thing is that he's self-controlled. And this, of course, is a, an evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. So it's a Spirit-led life that's disciplined, self-controlled. Next, he's respectable. Respectable. Well, what can we take from that? Well, he's the, he's the kind of man that you, would, that you admire and want to follow. He's respectable. He's honest. He has integrity. He's the kind of person that you want to model your life, about, life after. You know, I heard people just yesterday at Phil's memorial service speaking about Phil in, in very positive, uh, esteeming ways, and rightly so. He was respectable. He was the kind of person that you admired for who he was. He was a man of honesty and integrity, and, and he, he had a kind, kindness about him. The next thing on the list that we find here, the next quality, is that he's hospitable. In other words, his heart and his home are open to others. His heart and his home are, are, are open. 
And you're, you know, he's, a, he's that kind of a person where you're, he's approachable. You can, you, they welcome you in. He's the kind of a person who, in our case, Lori and I, we love to have people over. And so it's that kind of a hospitality of heart and mind. The next thing, of course, is he's able to teach. And I think that this is particularly speaking about he demonstrates the spiritual gift of teaching which is different than just being a teacher because you need to fill the void of a class that needs a teacher. It's someone that actually has the gift to teach. So that, I believe, is essential in the role of a pastor, and, 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 and particularly a pastor, and also, I believe, as well as in, in terms of an elder, able to teach. The next thing, in verse 3, you find four prohibitives qualified by the word not, not, not a drunkard. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not greedy. And we go back through there, we can say he's, first of all, not a drunkard. He's not controlled by alcohol. You can write Ephesians 5.18 down. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The next thing, not violent, but gentle. In other words, he doesn't have no evidence of a bad temper. He doesn't just fly off, you know, the handle and that kind of a thing. He's controlled. Not, not violent, but gentle. There, next, not quarrelsome. In other words, not contentious or stubborn-headed, which go together a lot of times, I think. Not quarrelsome. Next, not greedy. In other words, there's, he has no demonstrated, no, not a love for money. Not, not you know, money-grubbing, if you will. The, the word there in the old language was he's not subject to filthy lucre. <laughs> So let's look here at 1 Timothy 6. With that said, 1 Timothy 6, since we're in this letter, turn over to chapter 6 and follow here. I'm going to read, read down here. and talks about, um, you know, those that stand against, the false teachers that come against us. And he says here in verse 4, he says, He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words and produce envy and dissension and slander and evil suspicions and so forth. And Paul's laying out what Timothy ought not to be. And then he ends here in verse 5, he says, but the constant friction among people who are depraved in mind, deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness, verse 6, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can make nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So that's the next thing. He's not greedy. Now we move into the verse 4. We find here these words, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And to me, I feel like the best way to put that succinctly is that he's a spirit, he's demonstrated himself to be the spiritual leader in his house, the spiritual leader in his marriage, the spiritual leader in his home, the spiritual leader with regard to how he, he addresses his children. His children respect him. They listen to his counsel. They follow him, uh, and they obey him. There's an obedience that's, that's commensurate with that. And I think that that matter of spiritual leadership in the home, again, is a must-have quality for a pastoral leader or an elder in the church, obviously. He must have that kind of a qualification. The next thing is here, it says there that he must not be a recent convert. And I think that the best way to put that would be that he's he's not, he has a, uh, his faith is mature and it's tested. Over in chapter 5 here, 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Don't be lay, hasty in the laying on of hands. Why does he say that? I think in part when you look at the preceding few verses right there in chapter 5 is the fact that a, per, a man who is considered for position as an elder in the church must be a man that's been tested, proven. His life, how he is, how he truly is, has been manifest in his life over a period of time. 
it is one of the great challenges, frankly, as we consider interviewing candidates for a pastoral position because we we're not going to have the luxury of that time. So we're going to need to lean into references and calls to people that, that know this man before we and come, that he would come here uh, when that time comes. But this person must be mature in his faith and tested in that there's something about time that tests things and proves itself out. The next thing that we've seen, number the 14th thing, is that he has a good reputation. Must be well thought of by outsiders. And that, to me, is a matter of personal integrity and honor. And the, the 15th of the quali- qualities is that found in actually in Titus 1, 9, where it speaks about that man's ability to not only know the, the Bible and the scriptural truth, but be able to stand against and refute those who are false teachers. And I feel, again, that that... that quality, that characteristic quality, there are times when one must do that. And that's not something that you constantly have to do. But at times, if when, when needs be, you need to be able to put your foot in the ground and say, no, that's false. No, that's not true. That's not biblical, whatever. And you need to have that ability to be able to stand in that moment and say those things according to what the Bible says. So this first thing that we're looking at this morning has to do with the character of the shepherd, and that we focus on the character of the shepherd. I think the Bible here focuses on the character of the shepherd first because it it underpins everything else that he will do and how he carries out his responsibility. The next thing that we could consider in this regard as the shepherded church is that is the calling of the shepherd, the calling of the shepherd. And with that, I want you to turn with me now over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to look at the calling of the shepherd. The church is a shepherded community. And so the first thing was the, ca- the character of the shepherd. The second thing is the calling of the shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, Peter writes, and So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is, that is going to be revealed, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, you will receive the the unfading crown of glory." So again, once again, we think about the calling of the shepherd. The elder pastor shepherd uh, serves the local church under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. I, I, my, and my responsibility is lead pastor here at Living Word. I don't see myself, I've never thought of myself as being a standalone autocrat, you know, that I have, lips it up in some ivory tower raining down fiat from on high to depend de- de- and dictate what goes on in the church. And no uh, pastor should, should think of himself as that way. No, the, the pastoral shepherd has been called to do some things, and amongst them are to lead the church, to guide the church, to watch over the church, and to protect the church against the flock of God. I mean, if you think of analogously the idea of a shepherd who's standing over the flock, watching over a flock of goats or sheep or what have you, he's doing so to safeguard the well-being of the flock. And, and that is akin to the pastoral responsibility, I believe. The pastor clearly is not called to be the chief executive officer, nor is he called to be the chief operating officer. He's not an autocrat sitting atop an, uh, the organization of the, of the church demanding and decreeing things, you know, and so forth. The church is a living body. The church is a living organism. It's first and foremost, there is an organizational component or aspect to it, certainly, but the church, first and foremost, is effectively an organism. It's a living thing. It's the body of Christ, and therefore, the calling of the shepherd as a pastor is, is reflective of the servant-hearted and humble-mindedness and that, 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 of a leader that Jesus actually described in, to his disciples. I'll read these words that come out of Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10 where Jesus said James and John had come to him and asked for a special favor, of course, here in this passage, to sit on his right and left hand when he came into his kingdom. 
And Jesus calls them to him. He says, well, you know that the, those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so with you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be, your, be first among you must be saver, or bondservant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, he says, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we see the, the, the calling of the shepherd must be a reflection of the heart of Christ. And Peter here defines that here in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, where he says here, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have, would have you. So the shepherd, the pastoral shepherd's leadership in the congregation is not to be heavy-handed, it's not to be dictatorial, it's not to be forceful and demanding or in any way coercive in nature. And just as Jesus would lead, so the pastoral shepherd is called to lead the church in such a way that the, that the people willingly follow. Why? Because they know that he loves them. They know that he cares for them, that he's, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It's it's all about that. Paul wasn't being self-aggrandizing. He wasn't patting himself on the back when he said that. He was saying, as I follow the Lord, follow, let's go together. And that's how I feel as your pastor. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's go together. We're following Jesus Christ. And that's that's really important. In verse 3 here in 1 Peter 5, he goes on to say, he should not be domineering over those in your charge, but, but rather be an example to the flock. Be an example. In other words, the pastoral shepherd's life and ministry serve, as we've already said here, as a Christ-like example of meekness and gentleness and humility of spirit as he leads the flock of God under his care. There's a couple of verses, actually, that just came to me this morning. I didn't give them back here to Bryson today, but they come out of First Thessalonians in chapter 2. First Thessalonians 2 in verses 5 through 8, where Paul writes this, we, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, although we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so... Being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. And I can tell you folks that that's how we feel, Lori and I, about you all. That we care about you. We love you. And there are times when perhaps we're not as available to you as we wish we could be. And you understand that. We love you guys. We're walking, watching over you and caring for you and trying to give the, the best kind of shepherding leadership that we, that we can. And that's how I personally feel as your pastor. So the church is a shepherded community. Certainly, and we look at the, the, the character of the, the shepherd, we look at the calling of the shepherd, we're committed together in, in the body of Christ to, to following the Lord Jesus together. But there, that to do that requires one more thing, the cooperation of the sheep. Let's look at that. Buckle up. <laughs> the cooperation of the sheep. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5, first of all. The cooperation of the sheep. So as covenant ministry partners in the local church, there is an incumbent reciprocal responsibility that we each must accept and share. And the genuine cooperation of the sheep who comprise the local church is essential if we are to fully reflect God's heart, plan, and purpose for our ministry here at Living Word Community Church. So first of all, as I said, 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's look there. In verses 12 and 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. Paul, again, he's writing here, We ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work and be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourself, yourselves. So as instead of the idea of a member here, our leadership team, as we'll find in the weeks to come, when I get back from our vacation time in a couple of weeks, 
We're going to pick up a a little mini-series about what it means to be a covenant ministry partner here, a covenant ministry partner. And as a covenant ministry partner in the local church are called to show their shepherd leaders the honor that we deserve and and as men who have been appointed and called to that office by, by the Lord. And Paul uses the ideas of respect and esteem for them, and and that is a it it is deserved, but it's as much earned as it's as much earned by myself as I shepherd you. And it's it's I I hope that you esteem me, and I appreciate the respect that I experience and receive from you all. But I don't take it for granted. I don't take that lightly. It, so it's both something that I feel your responsibility to me looks like that, but it's also something that I hope that I that I can earn that and retain that esteem and respect for you. When we move over now, we're going to move a little bit here. 1 Timothy again in chapter 5 this time. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Another matter of the cooperation of the sheep. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Paul writes this, he says, Do not admit a charge against an elder, an accusation in other words, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. For as those who persist in sin, rather as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Again, there are situations that we're probably familiar with that that do require that we address a a leader a pastoral leader and elders, known sins, certainly. And where those sins are verifiable and evident, they must be dealt with in accordance to this passage of Scripture right here, these two verses. They must be dealt with straightforwardly. However, in the cases where there is an unmerited accusation, an unfounded false charge of misconduct, simply due to the fact that someone doesn't like the pastor, and has an animosity or an unforgiveness or begrudging attitude toward their pastor, then the discipline that they want to fall on the pastor is going to be directed at them. And that must be dealt with straightforwardly in the same way. And it comes back to this matter of reciprocated responsibility in the church. And that's something that you must know for yourself. But, you know, I've been around long enough to understand that there are people that are, that are kind of go underground a little bit, and sometimes those kinds of things can happen, be said attitudinally or verbally, that undermine the, the, uh, the leadership of the church, the pastoral's, pastoral leadership. And in that regard, those things must be addressed. If I'm in the wrong, then I would hope that someone would come to me and say, Pastor Steve, you're in the wrong, and this is why. This is what it is, that kind of a thing. And I, and I believe that I hope to, that I will receive that counsel with humility and an attitude of my heart. The next passage that we could turn to as we go here, moving along, is in Hebrews chapter 13. The book of Hebrews chapter 13. A couple of verses, verse 7, Hebrews 13, 7, and Hebrews 13, 17 in turn. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And here again, as covenant ministry partners, covenant ministry partners are called to come under the spiritual leadership and, if I may use the word, authority of their leaders. Those who are unwilling to do so actually stand in direct uh, conflict to these words here today, direct violation of this biblical injunction, and actually, by virtue of that, keep the church from being able to thrive as a ministry of of, of the Lord. And so I would just say that people that withhold that uh, willingness to come, that attitudinal thing, and behaviorally to stand against the leaders uh, with a a resistance, I would just call people to seek to be reconciled and to pursue a reconciliation with your leaders, myself or others here. Uh, Why? Because if you don't, the chances are a root of bitterness is going to come. 
into your heart, and that is extremely difficult to uproot. A bitter, a bitter heart, a bitter attitude, an, un, an unforgiving spirit, all of those things actually do far more spiritual harm to you than it would ever do to me or to your leaders. So we need to seek to be reconciled to each other and pursue for forgiveness in the church. And then here in verse 18 of Hebrews 13, the writer goes on to say, and pray for us, for we are sure that we have a... Uh, a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. And again, I, covenant ministry partners, pray for your shepherd leaders. Pray for us. Pray for me. And I know many of you do, asking the Lord to guide me, bless our leadership team, our elders, our deacons. Uh, why is that? Because prayer not only softens your heart, but it aligns your attitudes with Christ. Softens our hearts and aligns our attitudes with the Lord Jesus Christ. And one last place that we're going to go as we land today is back in 1 Timothy chapter 5, one final place. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. I have left this one for last intentionally, by the way. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Well, Paul writes this, he says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So in terms of the cooperation of the sheep, obviously the covenant ministry partners uh, pledge to provide well and for the well-being of their pastoral shepherds and their families. Um, and I very much appreciate, as, as Lori does, the commitment, the the dedication to doing that that we have experienced, that we have received over years of time out in here in Franklin County since we moved here 20 years ago. And I appreciate that even to this very day. Uh, our, the support that we get financially uh, has been a blessing to us. And we believe that our church is, is on good ground in that regard. But that is one of the, fi- that's the final evidence of the cooperation of the sheep. So we think of, again, as we bring this now, this series to its conclusion, the church is, we land here, the church is finally a shepherded community under the authority of Jesus, the chief shepherd, and by virtue of his appointment of myself and our elder team as we lead our congregation with a heart to shepherd. I know that's, that is Curtis and Myron and their particular hearts as our two elders, our two deacon couples, Rod and Kim, Eric and Sabrina. As we lead you, I can assure you that we pray for you. We're meeting this Tuesday night once again, our monthly meeting. And we spend a lot of time in prayer talking about the needs of the church. We, our heart is for the church. Um, and we, are, we strive to, to lead in such a way that reflects the heart of Christ for you. And for us as a church, we, we don't have all the answers. We, we seek the Lord. We try to act in a way that is commensurate with God's heart. And we thank you for the prayers that you support us by in, in your way, in the words of kindness. I, I, I at times have received encouraging notes and words, and I appreciate that very much. And that's what the church is. The next two couple, couple of weeks, Lori and I, we are actually this coming Saturday leaving for a two-week trip to Florida. Uh, we have an opportunity to attend a uh, pastoral retreat for senior pastoral couples in Kissimmee, Florida, uh, har- sponsored by Harvest Foundation. And at, um, that group sponsors this once a year annually for senior pastoral couples. Um, and we have been invited to be there uh, for five days for the first week of our trip, uh, we'll be there uh, the, fir- the last full week of August, actually, Monday through Friday, and uh, we'll just enjoy some time there relaxing. And from there, then we'll travel a couple hours south southwest uh, to Sarasota and stay down there for a week and actually go to the beach, which is what we most enjoy when we vacation, and we'll be at the beach at Sarasota. And then we'll be returning home on the 6th and 7th, making a two-day drive from Sarasota home and be back for that weekend and my pastoral mentor then will be speaking that Sunday the 9th I believe it is of September 8th 8th maybe it's the 8th of September 
And so there will be three consecutive Sundays where someone else will be filling the pulpit. Next Sunday is a man named Steve Cook, who is new to Churches and Missions. He and his family will be here. They're parents of uh, five children. Uh, they live in uh, Edmondsburg now, Edmondsburg, Maryland. They'll be here next week. The following week, Jordan Wheeler will be here. Um, he's been on staff at Joyelle for the last uh, seven years, six or seven years. He'll be here. He's a young man. And that third Sunday, as I said, Jonathan Yoder, my pastoral mentor, will be here in the pulpit. Lori and I will be back that week, Lord willing, but he'll be speaking on in my stead. So we covet your prayers. Lori and I, we thank you for the chance we have to get away a little bit and to uh, relax. And uh, I'll be more tan when I come back. Yeah. Just saying. She doesn't like that. I get tan, she gets burned. Who knows? I don't know. Whatever. It happens. Anyway, but thank you so much for that. Let's, let's thank the Lord. And let's go to prayer as we close today. So, Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you have called your church to be a community. That you have called your people to be in community. That you have welcomed us into the family of God. That you have set us in, in a local church body as we are here at Living Word. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of the believers. We thank you for the strength that the body of Christ affords to us as we remain in community. As we fellowship together, as we serve each other, as we give of ourselves to each other to uh, carry out and uh, deploy the gifts that we have uh, for the good of Christ and the, the good of each other. We thank you, Father God, that you are working here in living word. And we thank you, Father, for the chance that we have to, to be uh, a place where the gospel is proclaimed in our community. Help us to be faithful in that. Lord, help us to be mindful of the needs of others. And help us, Father God, most of all, to reflect the glory and honor of Jesus Christ in our world and in our homes, in our neighborhoods, our places of work. We give you praise and glory today in Jesus' name.